beautiful people and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for this period action day 2021 session on hashtag periods are optional. My name is Amber Wynn. I use she, her pronouns, and I have the honor of serving on the Youth Advisory Council here at Period, in addition to the Board of Directors. And I will be your host today to discuss menstrual management. Today, we will be having an engaging conversation with panelists who have lots of passion and experience in this topic. We will start by having each panelist introduce themselves. So I will pass the baton over to you, Dr. Yen. Hi, I'm Dr. Sophia Yen. My mom said, claim all your titles. So whenever you're anywhere, claim all your titles. I am a pediatrician that specializes in teenagers and young adults. So what we call sex, drugs, rock and roll, a little acne and some sports medicine. So technically I'm a clinical associate professor at Stanford in the department of pediatrics in the division of adolescent medicine. I'm also the CEO and co-founder of Pandia Health. And Pandia Health is the only women founded and women led and only doctor led company in birth control delivery. We love the credentials. I, I, I love it when a woman of color brings her own flowers to the table. So I definitely appreciate you, Dr. Yed. Next, yeah. I'll pass it off to Ms. Hodan. Hi, my name is Karen Barr. I'm currently a student at the University of Texas on Austin. Um, I'm basically an activist for period equity and business and things centering around that. Um, and I'm also part of the period advisory board. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you. So with that being said, we'll get right into the session. Um, did you all know that the number one cause of missed school and or work under the age of 25 is a heavy and or painful period? Hence the reason why we're gonna talk about menstrual management today. So our first question will be, do I need to have a period month? Like, do I really need to have a period? Is it essential? So I think that physicians and the medical community have been really good at getting it into those with uterine heads that you have to have a period every single month if you're not on any medications. That's the key part. And also, if you're a newbie to periods, I want you to know, because I get this question on YouTube all the time, is if you're within your first two years of your first period, it could be totally whack. However, if it's come every single month for six months in a row, and then it goes away for three months in a row, then maybe you should see your doctor. But with the first time you have it, it could be three months later, then six months later, or whatever. It can be totally whack for the first two years after your first period. And then what we're here today, I'm here today to share, is that once you know your periods are coming every single month, and the reason if it's not coming every single month, the doctor has to look for medical badness. So it could be a tumor in your head, it could be a thyroid disease, most likely it's stress or it's malnutrition, undernutrition. If you're doing like sports and you're not eating enough to keep up with your sports, or if you have an eating disorder, those are the things if you're not on medication, we need to look for. But we, I want to share today that you don't have to bleed every single month and that it's actually not, quote, natural to bleed as many times as we do in the Western world. Because if you were to go to the Dogon tribe in Africa right now, not like 30 years ago or whatever, Dr. Beverly Strassman, another woman, PhD, um, studies the Dogon tribe in Africa, and they banish women to the menstruation hut every single time they bleed. But that's a different story, and we'll go there another day. But these women have um, start their periods at 16. We start our periods at 12. They have eight to nine periods a year. We have 13 periods a year because we have lots of nutrition. They have, <clears throat> excuse me, they have eight children in their lifetimes. We have two. They breastfeed for 12 to 15 months. We breastfeed zero, three, or six months. So in summary, they have 100 periods in their lives. We're having 350 to 400 periods. So what is natural is what's happening in Africa. What is unnatural is what's happening in the first world countries where we have a ton of nutrition. So as soon as you hit 100 pounds or 22% body fat, your body goes, oh, I have enough energy to share. 
I can make a baby. And so that's why we hit it at 12, 12 and a half, the average age of getting your first period here in the United States versus 16 in Africa. And also because of the babies, um, how many periods you have when you're pregnant? Zero. How many periods you have when you're incessantly and exclusively breastfeeding? Zero. So the natural state of the person with the uterus is actually pregnant or breastfeeding, which is far less bleeds than we're having here in the USA. And also every time you build up that lining, you risk endometrial cancer. Every time you pop out an egg, you risk ovarian cancer. So if you're doing this 350 times, then you have ovarian and endometrial cancer, which they aren't having in Africa because they aren't doing 350 to 400 periods. I'm, I'm kind of speechless right now. That's, that's in, wow. I'm so sorry. I'm, wow. Okay, so they're having like 100 periods in their lifetime and having more children. Yes. And breastfeeding. So it's due to diet as well. It's diet is, you know, four years difference of when we have periods because they're having it at 16, we're having it at 12. Also, they're only having, you know, eight or nine periods a year. We're having 13 again because we have lots of nutrition. And then the big part is being pregnant for eight or nine children, whereas we're only pregnant for two children and breastfeeding for 12 months. So every time you have a kid, it's like nine plus 12, almost two years of no bleeding because you're pregnant, then you're breastfeeding constantly and that decreases your period. So they have far fewer periods than we have and therefore less risk of ovarian endometrial cancer as well as less landfill, as well as less need for menstrual products. So would you say that like, even though they're having less menstrual cycles in their lifetime, their flows are what, I don't like the term normal, but it's not like an abnormally heavy flow. It's a normal flow. Yeah. Yeah. It's not particularly heavy or light. It's, you know, as you know, each person with the uterus has different flows. Some women are blessed with really light flows. Some women have flows that go on for like seven days or more. If you have a flow that's greater than seven days, please see a doctor because you might be losing too much blood and getting anemia. So if you're feeling cold, tired, looking kind of pale here, um, then you should talk to your doctor and just check your hemoglobin and iron to make sure you aren't having anemia. The number one cause of anemia in a menstruating woman is menstruation. Wow, thank you for sharing that with us. That, I'm still kind of taking it back. Um, so I guess I'll slide to our second question. Is it safe to make hashtag periods optional? What are the risks and benefits and who especially would this be good for? So what is the ideal, ideal optional period candidate per se? Yes, so it is safe. And the research has actually shown by having fewer periods, you decrease ovarian and endometrial cancer. It also decreases colorectal cancer. And my thought on that is because your uterus is here and then your colon is here. And as this is going up and down and up and down and bleeding every single month, the colon's like, hello. And there's like hormones going on. And so what we don't talk about, and I think it's really important that we with uteri stop sucking it up and start telling the world what we go through is that 30% of us with uteri who bleed have some GI effects. So some people have diarrhea, some people have constipation, and that's because of these hormones that are going out up and down, up and down every single month. And so it also decreases colorectal cancer. Most of us, if we live a really, really healthy life, are going to die of colorectal cancer. Otherwise, we're going to die of heart attack or stroke because we have too much cholesterol or, you know, cholesterol in our blood going to a heart attack or into our head. But if we live a really healthy life, we will die of colorectal cancer because it's the size of a football field. And what are the odds it's going to keep replicating over 80 to 100 years without a mistake? So um, it's great that by having fewer bleeds every month, you can decrease ovarian, endometrial, and colorectal cancer. There is a theoretical slight risk in breast cancer, but that risk goes away as soon as you stop the birth control for about five years. And um, the benefits is actually um, having your period going up and down, your hormones up and down every single month is not good for people who have 
asthma, for people who have diabetes, for people who have seizure disorders, because those are situ depression, those are situations where you want the hormone to be solid. You don't want up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, because absolutely with seizures and diabetes, you need to have a stable level of sugar, stable level of seizures. And then depression too, emotional up and down, emotional up and down. And then um, it's actually been shown good for asthma and arthritis as well. And then in terms of who would this especially be good for, um, we were talking before military. You can imagine if you're like in some outfit that's all tight fitting and you're running away from attack dogs, if you're the only one giving off the smell of blood, you're going to be the one attacked. Or if you're in the Navy SEALs and you're in the water and there's sharks around, you're going to be the one that gets attacked. Or space. When they had the first woman astronaut, they didn't know how many pampons or pads to pack for her. And they packed way too many for her trip. But also things are floating around in space. Try to stick a maxi pad or tampon and the blood, you know, going in different places is, is not a good situation. But I say um, I'm a tiger mom. And the example I give is I was a pre-med at MIT in the middle of a biochem final. And all of a sudden, blood. And I'm like, ah! Do I run to the bathroom or do I finish the exam? And you know the answer is pre-med, you finish the exam. <laughs> was I a little distracted? Definitely. And I looked to my left, I looked to my right, this is MIT, two people without uteri, and they're like, boop, 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 boop. not a care in the world. I have two daughters and I want them to be on even playing ground with anybody without a uteri. And then I know they're going to crush everyone with a uteri because my daughters won't be bleeding during their exams. At the very least, you can move it away from finals, move it away from SAT, GMAT, LSAT, GRE, whatever. But you can also choose to have a period or it's actually not even a period. It's a withdrawal bleed every three months, every six months or never. I haven't bled for the past 11 years since my last baby, as long as I take my medicine. If I forget then I have a bleed. If I go somewhere and I forget, then I'm like, fine. And then I'll bleed for a week and then I'll go back to no more periods. I know also off camera, we had a discussion about um, sports and yeah. just throwing up, especially when I played on a soccer team growing up. And I don't know why, but some genius thought it would be good to have white shorts for <laughs> women's soccer. I don't know who thought that. And but, tennis. Yep and ballet and gymnastics, just like you're not at your happiest when you're wearing a pad or a tampon, you know? And sometimes the tampon, you forget it's there, but sometimes you don't, you know? And I've actually seen, um, there was an Olympic swimmer, not this round, but four years ago, and she came out of the pool and she's like, oh, I think I lost a millisecond because, you know, I'm on my period. And I was like, who is your team doctor? Because if I were your team doctor, you would not be bleeding anywhere around the Olympics. Because actually, when you lose blood, you have less hemoglobin running around to give you oxygen, in particular in a sport where you want to have that extra burst of energy. Or if you want to last the distance, whoever has the most oxygen is going to win. And that's actually why Lance Armstrong goes up to Colorado to get extra blood cells, because when you go higher up, you make more blood cells. But having a bleed every single month, you are losing blood cells. I like people to, I'm a visual person, take your arm, take a knife and go, <laughs> right? One week out of four and just bleed because that's what we're doing. And I had the realization, the only reason we bleed every month is we build that lining and we go embryo. Oh, no embryo bleed. And then we go embryo, no embryo bleed. And if you're not trying to catch an embryo that month, don't waste your time and energy building up that lining so thick to catch an embryo if you're not trying to catch an embryo and then bleeding. Men do not bleed one week out of four. And as an adolescent medicine specialist, I think I had the realization someday someone's gonna prove this. In adolescence, the men's hemoglobin goes up and the women's hemoglobin goes down. And I think it goes down because we're bleeding one week out of four. And if we were pregnant, it wouldn't bleed as much. And we wouldn't lose unlike the men whose hemoglobin goes up as they hit adolescence. That's amazing. So you, we kind of touched on this a little bit um, privately, but how does period stigma in myths impact the use of period products or birth control in various communities? 
maybe we can each speak to our personal experience. Hoden, do you want to start? Um, yeah, sure. So I would like to start off by saying that like, I grew up in a Black immigrant family my entire life or whatever. And so my mom came from Somalia like, during the late 1990s after a civil war had occurred in her country. And one thing that she had always grown up with was the fact that tampons would lose your virginity too, which was a myth that we kind of touched on earlier. And so in my household, even when I was 14 years old trying to introduce it, my mom was like, no, like that's not okay for you. And especially in Islamic religious family, they especially thought that a woman's virginity taken so young from a single tampon was not okay. But um, because of that, it had impacted me because I realized I could have helped myself in so many more situations if I did have a tap on. Like I would wake up in the morning and I would find myself bleeding all over my bed and my sheets and stuff like that. Or I couldn't even go to my college classes even right now working, you know, minimum wage jobs and stuff like that um, because I always had to to a pad. I even find myself today not knowing how to use a tampon and that's because I just always grew up with the mindset that it was bad for me and stuff like that. Or I just always grew up in a, you know, Somali community that always told me horror stories about using tampons. Like for example, girls would die from infections and stuff like that, from having the tampon in too long and stuff like that. So I'll probably say, especially in like immigrant families, you know, where they come from a world that's not used to using period products at all, when they see pads, it's just something that's seen as lighter, but when they see tampons, it's something that you have to learn and like stick within yourself or whatever. It's just seen as taking away, you know, what's sacred to a woman, like especially in like a lot of developing countries and stuff like that. And I feel like that had affected me because I still don't know how to use a tampon to this day. And it's like, I don't want to because I'm too scared to learn, but it would be really nice to be able to know how to use it. So I could just help myself day and night, but instead I find myself exchanging my pads and wasting so much money, especially in the state of Texas and stuff like that, with tampon taxes or like, you know, period taxes and stuff like that on period products, especially since I'm changing it every 12 hours. So yeah. So um, just to address a lot of the points that you brought up, you brought up a lot of really good points. For me, myself, growing up as a Taiwanese American, my, my parents grew up in Taiwan, came here and had me. I was born in the United States, but then was shipped off to Taiwan for a couple of years and then came back. We were a don't ask, don't tell family. So like, I don't even know or remember when I got my first stuff and it was pads because my mom had pads, my grandma had pads. So why would I use anything different? And only as a 30, 35 year old feminist doctor. And I was like, I'm this crazy feminist and I've never tried a tampon. <laughs> and then when I tried it, it was like night and day. Cause as you know, with a pad, at least, you know, different people feel their uteri differently, but I could feel the blood dripping down and like coming out. I could, my, my vagina would be like nim, 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 blood, you know, that kind of thing. And then when I tried the tampon, it was almost, you didn't feel any of that. And so now I present it to families as it's a cleaner option. Do you want to stop the blood where it originates right here? Or do you want to let it ooze out where it can then cover your pee hole, cover your poo hole? But my least favorite is all over the sheets. You know, that is my least favorite. And in general, we don't advise people to put in a tampon overnight, but that is my number one use for the tampon is put it in right before you go to bed. And as soon as you wake up, run to the bathroom and take it out because you shouldn't leave it in theoretically longer than eight hours. And sometimes we like to sleep 12 hours, right? Particularly teenagers and young adults on the weekends. And that's fine as long as as soon as you get up, you run to the bathroom and throw it away. And the, the infection part was really an issue back in the old days when they had super absorbent tampons with a different material. And so the risk of toxic shock syndrome is like two out of 200,000 people. And even then, what is the risk of dying from it? A lot lower because we have antibiotics and we have good doctors. So definitely if you leave your tampon in too long and you have a fever and whatnot, run to the ER and tell them and take out the tampon immediately. That's the first solution, but get some antibiotics and tell them that you're on it. But in terms of virginity, I really think we as society, one, shouldn't fixate on virginity. I was on a different um, video that's going to come out. And actually, I don't, I don't think they did it. But we were talking about, um, we shouldn't focus on virginity, but the first day that you had good sex, the first day that you had an orgasm, that's what we should celebrate and fixate on, not on the day that you lost your virginity. 
And I absolutely think we, at the very least we should define virginity as putting something in your hole for sexual pleasure of your consent. This is simply putting something in your hole to stop blood from leaking out. And the analogy I like to give is if you had a nasty nosebleed and it bled like stink, a doctor would put a tampon up your nose and we wouldn't be like, ooh, you're violating the sanctity of her nair. Her nair must stay virginal, you know, like, no, you, whatever it takes to stop that blood in the best possible way. And I really do think that tampons or if you're advanced, um, the menstrual cups are the best way to stop that blood where it originates rather than when it leaks out. And if you don't know how to do it, you can watch videos. If you really want to, your doctor would be happy to put it in, particularly for teenagers, pediatricians. But if you go to your ob and they'd be like, yeah, I'd be happy to put it in. And that way you know where it goes, how it feels. A lot of people putting in the tampon are shy and they're like, <laughs> and they put it like down here, the bottom third of your vagina can feel stuff. The top two thirds of your vagina doesn't feel anything. So you want to shoot it up there where it doesn't feel anything and it can catch the blood rather than down here where it's going to hurt. And then you also want to make sure when you put it in that you take out the applicator. We had somebody leave in the applicator and they're like, ow, ow, ow. And they just thought that was the way it's supposed to be. So you're supposed to push the tampon out of the applicator and pull it out. And then my other tip is get the pearl one. I know it's not like green or whatever, but it's smooth. Don't do the cardboard one. That's like painful and nasty. And <clears throat> as you become advanced, though I haven't moved that level yet, you can get the one without the applicator and you just shove it up with your finger. So it's just, you know, how comfortable you are touching yourself and how much waste you want to generate in this world. And hopefully someday, some I think someone is working on the reusable applicator, you know. So, um, but in terms of ethnic differences, I actually did research in college educated women from sororities, because that was my easy sample, from Asians, Blacks, Latinas, as well as Caucasians. And Caucasians on average, 80% of them were using tampons. And Latinas, Blacks, and Asians was 60%. And as I like to say, we came to this country, take advantage of what it has. And if 80% of Caucasians are using tampons, then we need to get to parity. Because once you try to tampon, you're never going to go back once you get used to it. And it takes, you know, one to three cycles to get used to it. The other um, tip I have for you is when you put it in, you want to put one leg up and the other leg down. So you're like spread and then you want to aim down because if you aim up, you might hit your urethra, your pee hole. And that is very painful. And someone has stuck stuff up their urethra. Don't stick it up your urethra. If you aim it this way, you will hit the right spot. You should know where you're butthole is and you shouldn't hit the butthole because that's on the other side. So um, those are the tips, but I'm sure other women would be happy to help you and a doctor would absolutely be happy to place it or, or a health practitioner. But there's definitely, I think, stigma amongst all the minorities and immigrants. And it really shouldn't be up uh, virginity. Your hymen is like this and you can actually get a tampon through it and not affect the hymen. But also, there are other things that can break your hymen, riding a horse, riding a bike, you know, gymnastics or something like that. And then also there's some people that have hymens like this. And so anyway, it's just um, we should get off of virginity. But if virginity is an issue, kind of explain it like it's what's clean. It's what, you know, we're taking advantage of America and it's what doctors would recommend just because it is cleaner. No, I definitely love that we were able to bring our own cultural backgrounds. And I love the fact that all of us are products of immigration because my mother immigrated to the United States from Kingston, Jamaica. So shout out to us. Love that. Um, I don't remember being in Jamaica and never having any stigma, but I've also never grown up there. I've only visited family, but I know within the Black community within the United States, like Hodan shared, it's, it's, if you use a tampon, you're viewed as promiscuous. Um, or as some people say, you're fast, which really does not make sense because as you said, it's a way to manage your period. And sometimes it's more effective. To this day, well, I grew up when in elementary and middle school, I was one of two black women um, in, my, in my class, in my entire grade, excuse me. So I didn't feel any of the pressure to like, oh, if you use a tampon, you're fast. But when I got to high school, that's what started happening. Mm -hmm. When I was in elementary and middle school, it was, 
you don't use a tampon? That's weird. Like you're not a real woman if you don't use a tampon. And I was receiving that from my white counterparts. So it's kind of crazy how the statistics that you say has really like it, it impacted me as an elementary school, middle school, and then a high schooler. Wow, everything comes full circle. Look at me still learning. So with that being said, Dr. Yen, I know for those of you who don't know, I've been following Dr. Yen with her work in Pandia Health, um, specifically with regards to emergency contraception accessibility and her work around birth control for the past two years. And I think that's part of the reason why I love talking to Dr. Yen so much because she's very intentional with her work. And I know privately we've had conversations about um, you did some research about how different birth control affects different, excuse me, ethnicities. Am I saying that right? Yes, race, right. ethnicity. Yes, I remember you saying that um, different races and just women of color in general, um, there may be options for birth control that are better for yes. them and have a better success rate. So I'd love for you to speak on that a little bit. Yeah. So, you know, I went to some of the best medical institutions in this country, Harvard, UCSF, Stanford, and I'm part of national organizations and email lists where we doctors present at conferences and discuss stuff. And we were always taught use this birth control pill because it has the least amount of side effects. And I forget that medicine is based on the 70 kilo white male. And then I don't know what they use for birth control, but I think it was a Caucasian female and because there was this one birth control pill and I, as a woman of color, tried that birth control pill. And as a doctor, I know how to take a pill every single day, but every time I tried it, I would get breakthrough bleeding. And so I had to go through three different pills until I finally came on one that I didn't bleed. And then as I got into my birth control company where I wrote 2000 birth control prescriptions in two years, I started to look at ethnicity and birth control pills. And I started looking at I want people to know there's 40 different birth control pills. So if one of them doesn't work for you, there's 39 other ones at least, or there's eight different progesterones. So if one progesterone, which is the key, I think for a lot of these side effects doesn't work for you, there's seven other ones. And so this one that didn't work so well is norgestimate. And I want people of color, if you're having issues on norgestimate, get off norgestimate and try one of the seven other ones. And so by studying them, I think I put together the first list of the different progesterones, how many milligrams are in each pill, and then sorting it by its progesterone effect, which is don't break through bleeding, and its androgen effect, which is mid view zits and munchies and mess up with your cholesterol. And I've optimized it and so with our patient population, we start them up on this pill, which works for me, but also talking to other doctors worked for Latinas and Blacks. And I was like, that's really interesting that it all works for us. And so if you're a Caucasian female that wants to bleed every month, norgestimate is good for you. But if you are a person of color, that may not be your best option. And I see a lot of my competitors out there pushing, oh, we can give you this really cheap pill, but it's not the best pill for you if it's the one that's going to give you breakthrough bleeding or, you know, nasty acne. Mainly it's the breakthrough bleeding. But if you're doing fine on what you're on, no worries. But if what you're on isn't working for you, then, you know, we need to look at it by race, ethnicity. And so because we've helped all these women, we're looking at the research to see if certain races, certain ethnicities do better on different progesterones. And we're seeing that result because when we put them on, we don't have any complaints. We follow people up in six weeks to be like, is everything okay? Because if it's not, we got others that we can switch you to. And so I think we absolutely need to do research by race, ethnicity in the future, and maybe even better to do it by genetics, right? Because we all are a mix of different things. Like Taiwan was colonized by the Portuguese. So I think there's a little Portuguese in my blood as well. And so nobody's, you know, quote, pure or whatever. We're a, a wonderful melting pot of, you know, the United States. So I would say that um, in terms of what's the best birth control, um, as the only CEO of a birth control company that's taken the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. We will always tell you what's best for your health. And what's best in the paradigm for medicine is IUD implant. And unfortunately, there's only, actually the implant's a different hormone, but all the IUDs have the same hormone. And so if you don't like that one, then try the implant. And then the shot is a different, and then the ring, the patch, the pill. And the reason these are good in that order is just the less times you have to mess up, 
the more likely it's going to work for you. The IUD can work for five to seven to 12 years. I don't generally recommend the copper IUD, or if you do, make sure you know it's more blood, more pain. But if you're a person who doesn't bleed much and you don't feel any of your cramps, copper IUD is for you. But if you feel every cramp and you bleed like stink, no, not the copper IUD. So um, I think that that's a good run through through all of the different um, birth control methods. Beautiful. So I know one thing that you just touched on that really resonated with me was the fact that BMI was created by and for people that do not look like you or me. So um, I know we've talked about how BMI affects periods and birth control, but I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that because I know um, for example, like someone could be my height, but 20 pounds lighter and have a completely different eye or be taller and thinner, whatever the proportions are, but have still have the same BMI as me. So I'd love for you to discuss how BMI impacts your period, but also how BMI impacts like birth control and emergency contraception efficacy, wait, yeah. efficiency. There we go. <laughs> so body mass index is um, you generally done in kilograms per meter squared, but it can also be done in pounds per inches squared. So you um, take how many pounds you are, square it, and then divide it by, wait, pounds? Oh, no. How many pounds divided by the inches squared, multiply 703, or just Google CDC BMI calculator, throw in your numbers, your height and your weight. And the reason it's important for birth control, we don't, BMI is something used in obesity and that's a different topic altogether. But for birth control, the research has shown if your BMI is greater than 30, then you can't use the patch because it won't work as well and it increases your risk of blood clots. If your BMI is 26 or greater and my BMI is 25 and thanks to COVID and dessert and not exercising, it could be 26. If your BMI is 26 or greater, plan B and its generics do not work. So I want all of you to share that as your public service announcement. I'm always like, Pandia PSA, you know, throw it out on your social media because a lot of people are pushing plan B and its generics because it's over the counter and you can just go buy it at the pharmacy or at a vending machine, which I think is great, but you really need to put a sticker on that vending machine that says, check your BMI. And if it's 26 or greater, plan B and its generics is not gonna work for you. However, there is a prescription only emergency contraception. And so if you see a doctor at any time, you can be like, I want some emergency contraception prescription strength in case of emergency, go fill that like a fire extinguisher, have it ready to go in case the condom pops, or if God forbid your friend is sexually assaulted, or if you forgot to take your pill, patch or ring for three days in a row, or you know stuff like that, and then it'll be ready to go rather than you run to the pharmacy and you're like, do you have it? And they're like, no, we don't. And you got issues and blah, blah, blah. But no under the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, former President Obama and current President Biden. There's no copay, no deductible, AKA free. If your doctor writes the prescription for Ella, which is the prescription emergency contraception, they don't pay me. I just don't want anybody getting pregnant. And that one works up to a BMI of 35. If your BMI is 35 or greater, then your only option is the IUD. But no, this is something your doctor may not know because they're not academic and keeping up on the papers and have residents and medical students saying, Dr. Yen, the latest paper says is you can use any IUD. So it can be the copper IUD or the hormonal IUD. If you need emergency contraception, just go to your doctor or go to the ER and be like, I need emergency contraception. And the IUD is the most effective method. It's 99.99999999% effective up to five days after sexual assault or contraceptive failure or condom popping or something like that. Um, but know that you can use the normal IUD too, which is great because I, I generally don't like the copper IUD except for emergency contraception, but now I have the normal IUD with hormone as an option. So if it were me or my daughter, that is what I would go for. And then if we were sexually assaulted and I didn't feel like having a procedure because I was traumatized, then I might go with um, the Ella, and the, but always have a pack of emergency contraception waiting. And I actually made fun of one of my competitors for writing emergency contraception for a lesbian, but now I realize anybody with a uterus can be sexually assaulted. And I've always said anybody with a uterus should have a pack of this around unless um, they have an IUD or an implant already in or they're beyond menopause. Beautiful. So with that being said, 
At Period, we always love to end everything with a call to action because we're all about the action here. So Dr. Yen, if you had a call to action to our viewers watching, what would that be? I would say share something you learned today or share something you think is important that other people don't know. And um, don't suck it up. Tell people if you have issues. I had a young woman who was working at, you know, it was Facebook, Apple, Netflix or whatever. And all the people above her were dudes. And she couldn't speak up and say, I'm late because I had to deal with my period or I had horrible periods and I couldn't come in today. But if you're missing work or school, please see a doctor. There is something we can do that you don't have to suffer with your periods so that you can go to work and school. Beautiful. And hold on, same question to you. I would say to not be afraid to be able to learn new things. Because today I was able to learn from Dr. Men on how I can realize it's important to learn the almost. Uh, especially going to college at UT Austin, there's so many tampons given out. And now I'm definitely going to go home and try one for the first time. So we'll see how it goes. Um, but also, I learned so much information about periods. I always thought, like, I always had the assumption that the more periods you have, the better it is because girls in high school would always be like, oh, I'm not having a period because I was stressed out. And I assume that was a bad thing for your body and not having as many periods would be a negative thing. But today, learning less periods is actually better for your body, and that was definitely a shock to me. So my call to action is to not be afraid to try good things, especially with the movement, and to not be able to, like, be afraid to learn new things and you know challenge yourself to yeah beautiful um what is my call to action because I do need to have one um I always say that my introduction to my reproductive health was the most abnormal in the best way possible um my mom having her period my mother like I said my mother immigrated to the United States and I don't believe my grandmother was here when she had her first period so imagine having your first period and you have to go to your dad and your dad's like I don't know how to help you bless my pop-up's heart he tried his best in the moment um but she made sure that when she had two daughters we were overly informed so as a fifth grader I probably knew I could probably like name every single part of my reproductive system. It was color coded um, and like we did games around it. I put pads on a tent, like a, my mom had like a doll that had underwear and she like taught us how to put pads on it. So like we normalized it. So when my period did come, I was more sad about the fact that I was growing up. I was not upset about my period because I just, I had a, I was struggling with the idea of like, becoming a lady and now having responsibilities because I wanted to be a kid and run around on the playground my entire life, which look at me now, I'm not doing that now, but I, my call to action would definitely be to normalize the conversation. Um, at my dining table, I was able to have these conversations with my, with my mom and with my sister, my dad, not so much, but he, he tried. Um, but, you know, I could, I could do that. I do that with my friends. I, I, you know, I realize going to a school where 95% of the students look like me because I attend a historically black college and university. I'm often educating students about periods. Like one, one person told me, oh, I just put on an overnight pad for the entire day. And I was like, oh, an overnight pad for the entire day. We need to, we need to unpack this. We need to rewind. Let's start from the beginning and then let's move forward. So normalizing the conversation is huge, even if it looks like us sitting on a Zoom call, if it means talking to your grandmother in Jamaica, if it means um, buying a pack of pads for the person sitting on the side of the road and just saying, hey, so you don't have to use that one pad for more than what you're supposed to. Normalizing the conversation does wonders, especially for the youth. Um, I consider myself youth, I'm only 22, but for example, Dr. Yen has educated both Hodan and I, and I will literally take this and probably write it in one of my papers um, because actually Dr. Yen, I meant to tell you, in one of my classes, I'm making my own version of Pandia Health in my management class. So I, I have an education format in it. So I'm definitely going to use this knowledge to like make sure I get an A because this, this type of education is priceless. So with that being said, I want to thank our amazing panelists for this discussion today, Dr. Yen and Pandia Health. Thank you so much. 
I've had the pleasure of learning from you for the past two years and it's always an amazing time we meet up and hold on, you know I love you. With the Youth Advisory Council, you bring such a unique and needed perspective to the conversation. So thank you both for sitting down with me and having this important discussion today. Thank you for having us. So lastly, I know I said the call to action was last, but how can we find both of you? Because I know some of our viewers may have questions or they may want to talk to you separately outside of this recording. So where can we find you on social media? If you if you use LinkedIn, you can use LinkedIn. I, I don't know, I feel I'm in college. So LinkedIn is like the big thing now, but how, how can we find you if anyone wanted to reach out? If anyone wants to reach out, um, at Pandia Health is uh, on Twitter, on Instagram, on TikTok, on Facebook. We also do a Facebook slash YouTube live at 5 p.m. Pacific on the first Tuesday, though not today. We bumped it to next week because of this, of every month at 5 p.m. Pacific in Espanol and 5.30 in English and, English, and you can hit us up at that time and just take over our thing and ask whatever question you want, or otherwise we have an agenda that we usually do on the first Tuesday of every month at five o'clock Pacific in Espanol and 5.30 in English. And then um, you can also find me personally on LinkedIn if you have a LinkedIn kind of situation that you wanna go and you can always ask questions on Facebook, YouTube. We generally try to answer questions, but technically we aren't allowed to give out any medical stuff. You need to talk to your doctor, but we can give you information that you could generally find on the internet. And you hold on. Um, as for me, feel free to email me at hudden, H-O-D-A-N, at period.org. Um, I'll probably respond or feel free to email, like, anyone with the period movement. I'm sure they'll have someone track me down or something like that in the Slack um, to text me and make sure that I do respond to you. So we'll definitely be fine. But yeah, you can reach me anytime after my email or do a period. So once again, thank you to our amazing panelists and happy period action day, everyone, whether it's means of sharing your knowledge, sharing your time, sharing your donations, make sure you do something to celebrate this amazing occasion. And let's normalize the conversation, the conversation around menstrual management, healthy periods, and just everything within the menstrual space. So thank you all again, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Happy period action day.